I'm Allison for Leading Edge Dog Show Academy, and today we're going to talk about form and function. Um, we're bringing you this because we get a lot of questions out there, you know, people starting to show their dogs or even groom their dogs that really need to understand how form and function go together. A uh, little reminder, like this is just kind of your quick start guide to form and function. If you'd like more details, diagrams, I invite you to check out the link below and go to Leading Edge Dog Show Academy excel as an owner handler understanding form and function and this is where we just go into really great detail i find this subject like super super interesting and i hope you do too so let's hop to it what is form and function well realistically um form what a dog should look like follows the function so the functionality of breeds actually came first so what happened is like farmer Steve down the road had these dogs that were like super good at herding sheep. And no matter where they went, like the sheep were always really well tended and they didn't get attacked by wolves and like all of these fantastic things happen. And other sheep farmers in the area decided that they wanted to start buying their dogs or getting dogs from farmer Steve because his sheep were so well looked after. And one thing that they noticed is like all of these dogs that were really great at herding sheep all kind of look the same right and that happens we get a bunch of dogs that kind of look the same because they're good at the same job and from those dogs doing their function doing their job somebody decided to write down what they look like their form and that form became standardized or breed standards as we know them today so I think it's really important to understand we didn't write down what a dog could look like and then start trying to breed dogs to look like that. We had dogs that looked a certain way, that performed a certain way, and in order to preserve the qualities that we wanted, we wrote down what they looked like, their form, in a standardized form, and that became a breed standard, okay? Uh, I love this, right? Like, I love that that's how these different breeds came around. Also, that's how breeds are still being developed today. You know, um, a very simplistic example would be we had um, Australian Shepherds and people liked them, but maybe wanted a smaller version. Hence came the American Mini Shepherd, right? So a smaller version. Now, don't hate on me in the comments. I know it's way more complicated than that, but like, you know, we wanted something that was smaller, more compact, but still had a lot of those great qualities. So there we go. So let's look at how some groups of dogs are categorized and why. So in North America, typically we have seven groups of dogs where each group of dog maybe performs a similar function, right? So therefore their forms might look the same. So we have the sporting group and these are dogs that are assisting hunters. A lot of them look similar, right? So our golden retrievers and Labrador retrievers have a similar job. They look similar. They perform these jobs in different areas, which is maybe why they have different coat types. Same with our setters, um, same with our pointers. Now the FCI has gone even further and kind of divides these into the retrievers and spaniels and our flushing dogs, like the dogs that are, you know, said to flush out the game or go get the game and bring it back to the hunter and into setters and pointers, dogs with those longer noses and longer bodies because they're actually supposed to be an arrow like kind of pointing at the game. Hey, there it is, right? And so we have these different groups of dogs and you'll, when you think about the sporting group, yeah, a lot of them look the same, but if you divide them down into those two groups, those two kind of subgroups look even more similar to each other. Now, if we move on to the hound group um, in North America, we put all of our hounds together and we have our sight hounds, so all of our fast racing type dogs, you know, a lot of them might look like a greyhound in one way, shape or form. A Saluki, Afghan, like they all kind of look similar. They have lighter bone, their bone is shaped kind of a different way. And then we have our scent hounds, right? Our scent hounds tend to have um, heavier bone for the size of the dog, rounder bone. A lot of them have longer ears to help trap the scent as they're following the scent, right? They hunt by smelling and following the trail where sight hounds hunt by seeing something and going after it. And then we have kind of a third little subset in there are teckles or dachshunds, right? Clearly all of our dachshunds look the same and don't look like anything else. 
So those dachshunds kind of like, you know, go after or hunt vermin that are in the ground, right? They get in there. So, you know, as much as we've put all of our hounds together, um, the FCI is even like taking them down into smaller groups that definitely have similar form, right? We'll all agree that our sight hound form as a group is much different than our tekel form as a group. They have very different functions as well. So that's why they're categorized that way. We have our working dogs, which are typically our dogs that are um, out there to help us, you know, be those guard dogs type group. And, you know, a lot of these dogs have like cropped or pointy ears. Um, and they just are often a squarish, more type dog. Even the Mastiff types um, have that, that bigger bone, but they all had this function of guarding, looking after things, kind of being big and impressive. And we can see that that form would help them in their function of being the protector. Um, we have our, our terriers, right? So a lot of our terriers look the same. Yes, we have long-legged terriers and short-legged terriers, but they needed to have that really harsh, dense, wiry outer coat to go after vermin and have that coat protect them from the vermin. So they had this function that they had to do, and it was really, really important that they have that similar coat type. They needed that coat, like that was part of the functionality of the breed. And so we wrote that down when we looked at all the dogs and that is standardized when it comes to those terriers. Um, now we've grouped together our small dogs that are our companions, right? So we have our companion dogs that are really just there to keep us company, do little jobs with us. Um, and our toy dogs that are diminutive in size and we are kind of the caretakers of those breeds. Now, interestingly enough, we've taken the Affenpinsir, which is in North America, is a, um, a toy dog, and we've put it into the working group when it comes to FCI. So I think it's interesting how some of these breeds came about. Same with our Yorkshire Terrier. The Yorkshire Terrier is in the Terrier group, and just interesting because it did have that kind of like that Terrier-like function. Um, we also have our cattle dogs and our sheep dogs, and we can agree that our cattle dogs and our sheep dogs do look similar, right? A lot of them carry their head in the same position. A lot of them have that double coat to work out there in the elements and stay with the sheep all the time. Um, and, you know, they have that stealth-like gait. Um, a lot of them are very, very headstrong because they needed to be. They needed to be hyper-focused on what their job was, you know, because if you shut your eyes for a second, some, you know, a member of your flock could come in danger. So they, a lot of them have the same form, therefore they had the same function and we wrote that down and standardized it. The FCI has another interesting group, which I kind of also really like. It's the Spitz or Primitive group. So these are our Spitz-like looking breeds because a lot of these groups you'll begin to see, like we do have a Spitz type, you think of a Samoid and like a Finnish Spitz. Um, a Shiba Inu, like they can be in different groups and kind of like kind of stand out as something that looks a little bit different in the working group in North America or in the non-sporting group or wherever they might be in North America. But when you put all of those spits together in a spits or primitive type group, they do all look the same. You know, they have pointy faces, pointy ears. A lot of them have that tail curled up over their back. And I just think it's a really great way to have dogs that have that same function, therefore the same form, they look the same, all grouped together. So to me, this is a very interesting topic. I think that it really helps you understand how you should show a dog in the ring because once you understand their function, therefore you have a better understanding of their form. What should that form look like? You have a better understanding of how you should move with that dog in the ring or what their proper gait should look like. You have a better understanding of how much expression should they give the judge. Like we want our spits and our primitive breeds to look very alert, but maybe we don't expect that out of a Saluki or an Afghan that should just be looking off into the distance, you know, looking at their prey. So I think understanding form and function really does help you be a better handler, a better groomer, just a better dog person in general, if you understand that, you know, keeping a border collie in your apartment when you um, can't get out to exercise them properly is, you know, their function, their years and years and years and decades and generations of breeding have led them to, that's not the kind of environment that they need to be in, right? So as I said, check out the link be below for Leading Edge Dog Show Academy, Excel as an owner handler, understanding form and function. I really think that this will up your game as a handler. And I hope today's quick start guide to form and function 
helped you out. Thank you so much for watching. Hey everyone, thanks for watching today's video. Please leave us a comment below, let us know what you thought, and as well, if you have any ideas for future content that you'd like to see, you can put them down there as well. You can head over to leadingedgedogshowacademy.com where you can find our free, premium, and subscription content, and we'd love to have you join us there. As well, don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on those notifications, that way you never miss another free video tutorial. That's it for today. Thanks for watching.